This is video hour one of running a successful group, a course sponsored by the Mindful Ecotherapy Center at mindfulecotherapy.org. If you're watching this video on YouTube and you're interested in taking this course for continuing education credit, you may visit mindfulecotherapy.org and purchase the course there. In video hour one, we will be discussing an overview of this course and working with groups. Before we get into the course materials, there are several course documents you'll want to download. The first is the course description or the course information packet. It contains the course objectives, a course description, plus references, resources, and citations. If you need this information for your licensing board, you may want to download it now. There's also a sample group rules, a sample group participation contract, and group rules and how to create them, and then finally the list of references and citations for running a successful group. Let's go over a basic overview of the course. First off, we're going to be looking at defining group work. What does it mean to be working with groups? Then we're going to look at different types of groups, planning for groups, and group facilitation. There are several subtopics in group facilitation. The first, we're going to be looking at the stages of change, that is the trans-theoretical model, or TTM. Then Tuckman's stages of group formation. Then seven skills that a facilitator will need. And then some sample group rules and sample group participation contract. If you've already downloaded the course documents, go ahead and get those out now. First thing we're going to be looking at is the sample group rules and then the sample group participation contract. If you haven't already gotten those out, go ahead and do so now. If you need to stop the video, go ahead. The first handout we're going to be looking at is the sample group rules. This is just a template to give you an idea of what a sample group rule should look like. You can modify it as necessary for whatever type of group you're planning to run. When planning a group, it's a good idea to have a discussion about group rules at the first session. The rules of the group should be up to the facilitator and the group members. It's always a good idea to solicit the group members uh, participation in forming the rules. That way they feel empowered to have a say in what the group will be about. Of course, within reason, you as a facilitator have the final say on what the group rules would be, but allow your group members to participate as well. And here's some sample group rules that you may find useful for planning your groups and helping you to get started. First rule is confidentiality. Group members should agree to abide by this rule. And we always use the old saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. This is also true of groups. What happens in groups stays in the group. Group members agree not to discuss each other's personal information outside of the group context and to respect each other's privacy. And depending on the nature of the group, you may want to have a rule that if people cannot keep the group private, that that could be grounds for terminating them from the group. It just depends on the nature of your group. Next is safety. Group members should agree not to attack each other verbally or physically when in group or outside of the group. And that's where you might have to use your facilitator skills to keep things from getting overheated sometime, depending on the nature of the group. Next is participation. Group members should agree to actively participate in the group, do all homework assignments, and show up on time. And we'll talk a little bit more about punctuality in a moment. But the idea here with participation is as a facilitator, a good facilitator will draw everyone in and make sure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. We'll talk later about a talking stick, but the idea of a talking stick is only the person holding the stick has the right to talk and everyone else should remain silent. So if you're having people who are withdrawn and don't seem to be participating, what I do in those cases is put everybody in the group in a circle and pass the talking stick around. And then everyone has a chance to speak and they don't feel like they're interrupting anyone else. 
course, you can also give them the right to pass, too. If they get the talking stick and they don't feel like saying anything, then they pass it on to the next person. But be aware that if someone is always passing, that you might need to meet with them after group and ask them what they could do or what you could do as a facilitator to help them to be more engaged and more participatory. Punctuality. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> Facilitators should honor those who show up on time by starting the group promptly at the advertised time. The 15-minute rule is a good rule of thumb. If a group member is more than 15 minutes late, it should count as an absence. And remind participants that tardiness causes disruptions to the flow of the group and is disrespectful to other members of the group. I go to conferences all time that are supposed to start, say, at 9 o'clock, and then they finally get uh, started at 9.15, 9.20 because stragglers are coming in. And the thing there is that if you don't hold a punctuality rule, then you'll find that people are showing up later and later for the group and you won't have time to get to all the group activities. So the best way to do that is I usually just start on time, even if it's only one or two people that are sitting there. <laughs> and then the rest will see that, yes, we're serious about the starting time so that they tend to show up on time. Plus, that honors the people who actually did show up on time and uh, doesn't reward stragglers by starting the group late. Next is absences, and uh, in uh, most of the programs I run, they're fairly intensive, and this is getting to be with uh, solution-focused and brief interventions, time is more and more critical. So if uh, someone is absent from a program, especially when one session builds on the other, it's going to be difficult for them to catch up. So it's recommended that you establish a firm policy regarding absences, and since each session builds on previous sessions in most groups, it's not recommended that participants should be allowed more than two or three consecutive absences, especially depending on the number of sessions that you have. Uh, next one is courtesy. Group members should respect each other and the facilitators. And this includes not interrupting those who are speaking. Uh, facilitators can use the talking stick that we just talked about if constant interruption becomes an issue. A talking stick, as we said, is just a stick or another object that is passed around among group members. It doesn't necessarily have to be a stick. It could be a uh, rubber ball or, or a little handkerchief or anything like that. But the idea there is that the rule is whoever is holding that is the only person that has the floor. And these are just some sample group rules that will help your program to run more smoothly. And remember that you can revise these rules at any time during the course of the program if necessary. And you should always solicit suggestions and input from the group members prior to making any changes in the rules. And if you do make changes in the rules, make sure that you inform the group members. And usually what I do if there's going to be a need for a change in the rules is I talk to the group about it and see what they think. But once you've agreed upon all the rules, uh, have someone type them up, make copies, and distribute them to the group members so that everyone knows what's expected of the participants. Now the next thing we're going to go over is a sample group participation contract. If you've downloaded that, go ahead and get it out now. And I'm just going to read it first and then explain the rationale as we go. By signing below, I signify that I understand and agree to abide by the following. The first is confidentiality. We've already talked about that a little bit, but on this particular sample it says that participants must be able to speak freely and openly. I would not like all others talking about my information. Therefore, I agree not to share anything that happens in group to other people. Uh, so basically, we're all respecting each other's confidentiality and privacy. And by signing below, I understand it's a violation of this confidentiality agreement to talk about things outside of group, and that could be deemed sufficient grounds to be removed from the group. What I have done in the past, this hasn't come up very often, but when it does, I just ask the group members to, to vote on whether or not they think that this is an acceptable thing and should this person be uh, expunged from the group, so to speak. <laughs> and um, I think I've done it maybe three times in my entire career, but it's very effective and the people get the idea and the message if you, if you turn it over to the, to the group to decide. Attendance and participation. I understand that if my attendance is a, understand that if my attendance in the group is mandatory, for example, court ordered, that the facilitators may be required to report information about my attendance. 
So I have a lot of child protective services cases come my way, and they're court ordered to treatment. And if they don't attend, then I'm mandated to report that. And I always tell them, you know, I have to report this when you're not here. So make sure you attend. And that way they don't get mad at you for, for turning them in. <laughs> I fully, further understand that in order to be successful in the program, I must attend all of the sessions. It says 12 sessions on this contract. This is for the mindfulness-based ecotherapy program, which is 12 sessions long. So in this case, if you, if you have a different number of sessions, you can mention those sessions in there. If it's an open-ended group, then you wouldn't have a set number of sessions, so you would just leave that blank. Uh, I will be allowed no more than two consecutive absences. Now, in an open-ended session, that's not so critical, but in a session, in, in a group where you have sessions that are building on each other and you have a set number of sessions, that might be more critical. I understand that if I'm absent more than twice, I may be dropped from the program and I will have to begin again at the next scheduled group. Again, this is more for a closed group than for an open-ended group, but the idea is there. I also understand that I am, if I am more than 15 minutes late, I will be counted as absent. By signing below, I agree not to disrupt the group by arriving late or leaving early, except in cases of extreme emergency. Now, you can generally, as a facilitator, tell what's an emergency and what's not. And sometimes, with certain populations, transportation is an issue. So, you have some leeway there as to what the rules are about attendance. But uh, just make sure that everyone understands what they are. I further agree not to engage in activities that may disrupt the group. I will not make phone calls during the group or leave the group during sessions except in case of emergency. Now, of course, things like bathroom breaks and things like that, that's not a problem. But I've had people in the past uh, take phone calls and disappear into the hallway and not come back for the duration of the group. They, they basically, this has been more in a, a situation where they were referred or court ordered to treatment. They'll show up long enough to be counted present and then go disappear in the hallway to answer a phone call and never come back. And after this happens a couple of times, you kind of get an idea of what's going on. So just be aware of that if that does happen. Um, the group meets, th this is blank here, you can fill it out to your own uh, standards and specifications. The group meets once per week on whatever day of the week it is and at whatever time. And of course if you meet more than that you list the number of days of the week that you meet and what time. Group informed consent. By signing below I agree to participate in the, this says mindfulness based ecotherapy program but you would put in whatever program it is that you're attending. My identity and the identity of any other member of the group or others involved directly or indirectly will remain confidential. Of course, that's uh, with the exception we already talked about. If they've been court-ordered, then you have to report to the court that they are attending or not attending. The facilitators will not use my name or personal identifying information in anything that is written about this group. Of course, the exception there is case notes, but those are protected by HIPAA if you do have to um, keep case notes. If data is collected for the purposes of research, no identifying information will be collected or retained. And again, that's if you're using data from the program for any sort of research. Although participation is encouraged, I understand that my participation is voluntary and I do not have to answer questions or speak unless I choose to. So basically, you're not going to force any group member to talk or participate. You might encourage them to, but if they choose not to, that's fine too. But uh, again, just find out, if, you, if possible, why they're not participating. Some people are just shy and they don't like to participate much. But if there's some other thing going on, then that's something you would want to address. I agree to respect the privacy of the people who participate in this group, and I will not share any identifying information or details about the discussion outside of this group. And if I have any further questions about the group, I can call. And here it's got a blank for a facilitator's name, of course. You may have more than one facilitator. In that case, you would list them. And then the facilitator's contact information. You put uh, the best way for them to get in touch with you. And then finally, I've read and understood the information above, and all of my questions have been answered to my satisfaction. Make sure when they sign that, that 
that uh, you have answered all their questions and followed up to make sure that they understand what they're participating in. And then by signing below, I voluntarily agree to participate in the group. First, before we talk about groups, we have to define group work. Group work is an activity with small groups of people that have specifically defined goals and objectives. The goals are directed at meeting specific psychosocial objectives and are keyed towards accomplishing goal-driven tasks. Now this is specific to psychotherapy groups. If you are doing a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group, that may or may not be in the psychotherapy context. If you're doing it just more as a coaching group, then it wouldn't really be as much concerned with psychotherapy. However, if you're doing it for treatment for a specific disorder or a specific uh, purpose, then it might be a psychotherapy group. For example, you could be doing a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group for addiction or for trauma recovery or something along those lines. In that case, it would be a psychotherapy group. And then you would only be able to conduct it if you're a licensed therapist. However, if you're doing it as a coaching group, then you're not as concerned with psychotherapy. And of course, the group is led by a trained group facilitator competent in the subject material. So if you're doing a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group, then you would have to have training in that in order to be able to facilitate it. And the activity is directed to individual members of the group and to the group as a whole within a specified system of service delivery. So let's break that down. Activity is directed to individual members of a group and to the group as a whole. In other words, we try to meet the specific needs of each group member while at the same time maintaining the focus of the purpose of the group. And within a specified system of delivery of services just means that we don't deliver services outside of our competency. And if there is a theme for the group, then we want to stick with that theme. So, for example, if it's a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group, we want to stay within the context of mindfulness-based ecotherapy. If it's an addiction treatment group, we want to stay within the context and the focus of treating addiction. If it's a trauma group, we want to stay within the focus of treating trauma, that sort of thing. And if you're in the mental health field, you know that groups have become increasingly utilized for treatment because they're cost-effective. In other words, they're less expensive than individual therapy. Groups also allow for mutual support among group members, for those who have been there, done that, and for normalizing what members may be experiencing. In other words, if I feel that I've suffered trauma and I feel like I might be alone, it can help me a great deal to be in a group of people who've experienced the same thing or similar things that I've had. And then I can see that I'm not the only person. I'm not alone. I've had other people who've experienced this who might be able to use their wisdom and their experience to teach me about what I'm going through. And group members also are able to join forces to bring about change. They're supporting of each other in a well-designed and well-organized group. Now, this uh, the downside of that is sometimes that groups can snipe at each other and start uh, arguing among themselves. So one of the skills a trained facilitator must develop is the ability to keep that from happening and to keep the goal on focus and keep the group on focus so that everyone achieves what they're there for and that they're able to support each other. The joining of forces in a group occurs in several ways. One, members support each other in pursuing personal change goals by offering suggestions and constructive criticism. The key word here is constructive. It's very easy for criticism to become destructive. In other words, not goal-oriented. And that is the dividing line there between constructive criticism and destructive criticism. What you're looking for there is solution-focused thinking. Is this criticism going to help us to achieve the goal that we're trying to achieve, or is it just there to knock people down and to try to make people feel bad? So you as a facilitator will have to keep an eye on that to make sure that group members are staying solution focused, are focusing on the goal. Members also learn from each other's ways of coping and dealing with challenging situations. 
some member who has experienced the same thing that I have might have a solution that I haven't thought of. So in that way, members are able to support each other. Members feel less isolated or stigmatized because they see similar people in a similar situation. And we've already discussed that, that um, I might feel alone and suffering with whatever it is that I'm going through. But if I'm in a group of people that have suffered a similar malady, then I know that I'm no longer alone. And it normalizes it and makes me not feel like an outsider anymore. Members are able to openly express and discuss feelings without fear of repercussion. This is the uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas rule. In other words, when we discuss group contracts, you have a contract there that uh, says that uh, you will respect the other group members' privacy, that you won't discuss things outside of group without the permission of the members, that sort of thing. So you're trying to create a safe and trusting environment where people feel free to express their feelings. And then finally, people in the same boat are able to respond more quickly to each other's needs. If um, I understand what you're going through, then we don't have to take time for lengthy explanations of what's going on. However, if I'm talking to someone who has never experienced what I'm experiencing, I'm going to have to explain, this is how I feel, this is why I feel this way, you don't understand because you haven't been there, that sort of thing. One of the first groups I ever facilitated was juvenile offenders, and uh, I was explaining some life skills, and this was when I was still a novice in the world of therapy. And one of the kids said, you don't understand what I've been going through. And uh, I fell into the trap of saying, oh, yes, I understand. I've had a rough life myself, that sort of thing. And I missed an opportunity. And what I should have done was reflected that back to him and said, you're right. I don't understand what you're going through. So please tell me, please explain it to me in a way that I can understand. And what this same boat thing is saying is that if you have a group of people who have a shared diagnosis or a shared experience, they already understand. You don't have to explain it to them. They know what's going on. So that saves time, number one. And number two, it puts you in a room full of your peers so that you feel supported by them because they all have been there. Another reason that the joining force of groups is so powerful is that members of the group understand one another more than people who do not share common problems and experiences. And I'd like to give you an example of my own personal experience again. When I started out my career as a therapist, I started out as a, an addictions counselor. And at the time, they were hesitant to hire anybody who was not in recovery, who is not recovering from an addiction. I was not recovering from an addiction, so I had a hard time finding employment as an addiction counselor. And the underlying theory behind that was that um, if I was not in recovery myself, I would have a hard time relating to people who are in recovery and who are trying to make those changes in their lives. So the idea here is that members of the group have at least one criteria in common that they share that they would like to explore more and to support each other with. So that can uh, greatly strengthen the joining factors of a group. Another thing that contributes to the power of group work is that members learn new ways of being in relationships by developing healthy communication styles and learning within the context of the group. In other words, they are able to modify their interactions based on sharing a common experience with other people. And in the context of a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group where people may or may not have a similar diagnosis, then the common factor there would just be love of nature and wanting to reconnect with nature and engage in nature's healing power. And members often learn through simulations, sometimes called role plays, of real-life situations. Now, a lot of times people are hesitant to engage in role play. But after a while, they are able to warm up to it. And if you have a group that is absolutely resistant to the idea of role-playing, then you and another facilitator can do some role-playing yourselves, or you can bring in videos. I've done that in the past as well. And members have the opportunity to give back by being a helper 
and not always the one needing help. There's been a lot of research into the fact that it's very difficult to focus on your own problems if you're helping someone else with their problems. So the idea of giving back, of nurturing others, that establishes what we call in mindfulness-based ecotherapy a reciprocal cycle of nurturing. In order for me to feel nurtured, I nurture others. And then when I nurture others, then they nurture me in return. The same is true of nature. If I nurture nature, then nature nurtures me. And group members also learn that the opportunity to help themselves by helping others increases feelings of self-efficacy and self-confidence. Nothing helps someone feel better about themselves than being able to help someone else. And that um, also manifests in the student-teacher relationship. As a teacher, I have found that I learn just as much from my students as I teach them. So that, again, goes back to that cycle of uh, nurture, that reciprocal cycle of nurture. As I nurture others, they nurture me. And that helps me to build my own feelings of self-confidence and self-efficacy and self-esteem. And by encouraging each other, group members can create an environment for positive change rather than for negative ruminations. And again, being an effective facilitator is going to be key to this happening. In other words, if there is any criticism going on in the group, always maintain a solution-focused approach to it. Make sure that any criticisms are on goal, on the purpose of the group. And if there are negative criticisms that are not oriented towards solving a problem or towards the goals of the group, then as a facilitator, you need to shut those down as quickly as possible. And we're going to discuss how to do that later on in the uh, training. But right now, let's just say that as long as there is an atmosphere of positive change, then that's what you'll get. You develop that positive feedback cycle. The more positive vibes you can generate in the group, the more the members of the group are going to generate their own positive vibes and continue to keep that focus. Remember that each member in a successful group has the opportunity to compare themselves to others in a positive way, recognizing their own strengths while helping others to grow stronger. Now let's look at some types of groups. The first is just basic support groups. And that is the groups like 12-step programs, AA, NA, grief support group, trauma survivor groups, those sorts of things. Then there are intervention groups, groups that are generally organized for a specific purpose or a specific intervention. Prevention groups, which are groups that are set about to prevent something like a non-smoking group or a non-drug using group. There's motivational groups which are designed to motivate you to do something. Social change groups, task-oriented groups, learning a specific task or a specific set of tasks, and then common interest groups. These are groups like uh, book clubs, things of that nature, where you're all coming together under a common interest. Now we're going to look at some of these groups in more detail. Support groups are groups that uh, are united with a common need, a common experience, or a common interest. An example of a common need might be addiction recovery, or grief support, or trauma support. A common experience might be an LGBTQ person, or a natural disaster survivor, or a family member with a person who has addiction. And a common interest might be ecotherapy, mental health support, parenting, etc., etc. So you can see how these might all overlap. For example, you might have an addiction recovery group for LGBTQ people, which common interest is ecotherapy. So you go out into the woods and do the mindfulness-based ecotherapy program with LGBTQ people who have addiction issues. So you can do a lot of um, tweaking with this to make specific gro groups for specific purposes. 
If you get too specific, you're going to run the risk of not having enough people to attend your group to make it an actual group. You might have only one or two people. (laughs) So you also have to be aware of the demographics of your area, the population that you're working with, so that you're not making it so exclusive that you don't have anybody to attend. Also be aware that categories for support groups can overlap. A person with an interest in ecotherapy might also have experienced trauma or might be struggling with addiction. So there are going to be people who have multiple issues. And if you focus on one issue, then they might be included in this group. But then again, they might not. So again, know your demographic. And groups can fall into all of the categories mentioned simultaneously or the focus on a particular category or need can develop. In other words, I'm doing ecotherapy for addiction or ecotherapy for anxiety, that sort of thing. So tailor your group to the needs specific to your community. And as we've already mentioned, common types of support groups include 12-step programs like Alcoholics Anonymous or AIDS support groups or grief support groups. Uh, Many support groups have open enrollment. In other words, there's no set number of sessions for the group, and members are allowed to join or exit the group at any time. Now, the mindfulness-based ecotherapy group is not an open enrollment group. There are 12 set sessions, each with defined goals and each with defined themes that we're talking about per session. But... If you do an open enrollment group, that means that people are free to come and go. There's no set time to register, that sort of thing. Although some support groups may be led by mental health professionals, most support groups are likely led by a peer who has had a a similar experience. For example, sponsors in AA who are in recovery themselves. Or a grief support group, say at a church or community center, might be run by someone who has lost someone in their life. So they're struggling with the same thing. So there are advantages and disadvantages to that. So for example, if you're in an Alcoholics Anonymous group, uh, that might be led by someone who doesn't have any professional training. So they don't have any therapy or counseling experience. They're just there because they have shared a similar uh, problem with addiction. So that can be a disadvantage if you're seeking professional treatment. On the other hand, the advantage there is that this person has gone through the same struggles that the group members have gone through, so that person understands. Like I was mentioning earlier, when I had a difficult time back in the 90s getting a job in the addiction treatment field because I wasn't in recovery myself. They didn't think that I could relate to the people that I would be treating. Now let's talk about intervention groups. Intervention groups are usually organized to address a particular issue or to implement a particular type of treatment or program. And intervention groups tend to implement more evidence-based strategies than support groups do. In other words, the curriculum used is based on research. And facilitators for intervention groups usually have more extensive training than for support groups. Here's an example uh, of, of an intervention group, something called IOP, Intensive Outpatient Treatment. These IOP groups are routinely used for substance abuse treatment, and they are led by a professional trained facilitator, usually a counselor or a therapist or a licensed uh, mental health person. And they are more goal-oriented, evidence-based, and they tend to be more effective than just a regular support group, which might be led by someone with no professional training. In general, that is the defining factor of an intervention group. Uh, Facilitators for intervention groups are usually mental health professionals or at least peer support specialists who have undergone some sort of training, usually by the Department of Mental Health or some other qualified agency that trains peer support specialists. And for such groups, the facilitator at a minimum should be extensively trained in the particular model being used. So, for example, if I'm using the matrix model for addiction treatment, I should have been trained in the matrix model. If I'm doing a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group, I should have had training 
in facilitating that group. And hopefully that's what you're doing right now. Intervention groups can be either open enrollment or for a set period of sessions, depending on the model being used and the desires and the needs of the community and of the facilitator. Examples of intervention groups can include anger management groups or DUI driver safety training groups or any other type of group along those lines where there is a specific set goal, a trained facilitator with experience in the field, and evidence-based treatment. Now let's talk about prevention groups. Prevention groups are generally behavior modification groups that focus on helping participants change a maladaptive behavior, or adaptive behavior, or series of behaviors that improve mental health and or physical health. Prevention groups are similar to intervention groups in that they usually follow a scripted agenda or prevention model. Examples of prevention groups can include EAP-sponsored healthcare groups or anger management groups. An example might be a weight loss group that is uh, sponsored by your EAP or a non-smoking group that helps you to stop smoking. Those sorts of things are all prevention groups. Motivational groups are designed to increase a person's motivation to engage in a given behavior. And these groups are similar to prevention groups as they are designed to promote healthy behaviors and discourage harmful behaviors, but different from prevention groups in that they take the participant's motivation for change into consideration. Motivational groups allow individuals a chance to learn from others who have been through similar situations. Motivational groups utilize the stages of change, which we'll be covering, covering later in this presentation, and these stages of change are used to enhance motivation. As a matter of fact, there is something called motivational enhancement therapy and motivational interviewing. And I'd like to tell you briefly about where those groups came from. There was a study called Project Match. It was one of the largest addiction studies ever done. And they were looking at various different addiction treatment models to determine which one might be the best to treat uh, addiction. And what they found was that the method of treatment was not as important as the person's motivation to quit. Motivation was the overriding factor. So out of that particular study, motivational interviewing grew. And what that is, is a system and a way of doing therapy that is designed specifically to enhance a person's motivation to engage in a particular behavior or to enhance a person's motivation to refrain from a particular behavior. It's used a lot in addiction treatment to increase a person's motivation to remain abstinent or to stay in recovery. But it also has a lot of other applications. And there's also something called motivational enhancement therapy, which is a school of therapy designed on increasing a person's motivation for specific change. That brings us to social change groups. Social change groups focus on changing a policy, procedure, or practice of concern within either an organization or the community at large. And they're usually focused on some type of educational or advocacy-related issues such as AIDS awareness, human rights, or mental health issues. In other words, they're awareness-based organizations or awareness-based groups. And you could say that the mindfulness-based ecotherapy group could be considered a social change group because what we're working towards is a paradigm where people will move to a more sustainable and a more green way of living by including nature in their lives. So from this perspective, a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group could be seen as a social change group, and it can be run that way. And such groups work to empower individuals for making change in society. Facilitators organizing such groups usually have an in-depth understanding of community organization, activism, local, state, and federal laws, and motivational speaking. Now let's go over that a little more in detail. Uh, community organization, if you're going to be in a social change group or facilitating a social change group, 
obviously you have to know the society that you're a part of. So you have to be able to organize in the community to be able to know who the leaders are, who the movers and the shakers in that particular community are so that you can advocate for social change with them. Activism, of course, being willing to stand up for what you believe in, being able to educate people in a positive and solution-focused, goal-oriented way, and not in a negative way. Uh, we have a lot of uh, <laughs> of uh, division in our political system right now. And what we're looking for here is more of a solution-focused, goal-oriented approach. In other words, when there's criticism or activism, it should be motivated towards a social change and not towards just tearing down the opposition. And working with local, state, and federal laws, you need to be familiar with what the laws are so that you don't violate them while you're advocating. And then, of course, motivational speaking. You have to be able to present your case to the public in a way that makes people want to get on board with your social change. And the final group we're going to talk about is task-oriented groups. And task-oriented groups are essentially work groups. So they come together to complete or accomplish a certain task. And then once that task is completed, they disband. Such groups come together for a set period of time to accomplish a common goal. So, for example, if um, you have an ecotherapy group whose goal is to clean up the trash on a certain stretch of highway, um, the United States has a program called the Adopt a Highway Program where your organization can adopt a certain length of highway and then you're responsible for picking up the trash and beautifying it and uh, taking care of it. So a group comes together for the set purpose of picking up trash on X number of miles of this highway. Once that is accomplished, then the task is over with and the group disbands until it's needed again. And some examples of task-oriented groups include planning for an event, advising an organization on issues and concerns, planning a conference, or organizing a political campaign. So, for example, if I am advocating for sustainability and for ecotherapy, and I am supporting a candidate who shares the same goals, then once that candidate is elected, I can disband the task-oriented group that was created to elect that person. The final type of group we're going to talk about is a common interest group. And common interest groups are groups that cater to an interest in a particular topic or activity. And participants share their knowledge and skills on the chosen topic with other members. So you can also look at a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group as a common interest group. And the common interest there is wanting to increase or sustain a relationship with nature with natural surroundings, be able to promote sustainability, promote nature as a healing system. And examples of common interest groups might include mindful meditation groups, or hiking groups, or ecotherapy groups, or outdoor sports groups. So the basic identifying factor there, again, is just people who come together with a shared interest. Now we're going to summarize before going on to the next session. Group work consists of goal-directed activities usually conducted by trained group facilitators. And again, the level of training of the facilitator is going to dictate the type of group. People with little or no training can organize and run support groups, whereas if you're doing an intervention group or uh, another higher level therapy group, you're going to need someone who is a licensed mental health professional. Now, I would mention also, this question comes up a bit when uh, people sign up to become certified mindfulness-based ecotherapy facilitators. Do you have to be a therapist to run a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group? The short answer to that is no, you do not have to. But you also cannot engage in any therapy or counseling when you're doing a group if you're not a licensed mental health professional. So what that means in the real world is that if you're running the group and you're focusing on the skills as outlined in the workbook, then you're okay. 
But if someone comes up to you and asks for advice with a personal problem, say, uh, I'm having problems with my spouse, what do you advise? Or uh, what should I do regarding my child's uh, problem? My child has ADHD or conduct disorder, and I need some help. Can you tell me what to do? If you then present yourself as a counselor or a therapist and give that person advice, then you're running into legal issues. You're running into legal trouble. Another example, uh, 12-step and support groups are great for what they do. And if, if people are motivated for change because of their membership in a support group, that's fine. However, most support groups of that nature do not have trained mental health professionals who are there to help people who become stuck in difficult issues. So what happens sometimes in those support groups is that a person practices outside of their area of training or skill or expertise and starts giving advice to people that is therapeutic or counseling in nature. And they walk a very thin line there of practicing mental health without a license. And I've seen some folks who have been damaged by that sort of thing, where a a person in a support group has told them something that later turned out to be bad advice from a mental health perspective. And when that happens, that person is setting themselves up for liability, for lawsuits. So be aware that if you're not a mental health professional and you're taking this course as a uh, facilitator for mindfulness-based ecotherapy, you want to stay within your area of competency. This course, if you're not a mental health professional, can be used as a coaching course. And as long as you stick to the skills outlined in the book, you're fine. But if you step outside of that and start doing counseling or therapy with your participants, then you're in danger of setting yourself up for a lawsuit or for liability. So just stick with the, the, the skills outlined in the book and you should be okay. And group work allows members to learn from and support each other. And we've already talked about that. That is very good, especially if there's a common interest or a common goal for people who are sharing that common goal to come together because they understand each other in a way that people who have not shared that common goal or that common problem don't. Group work activities can simulate real life experiences through role playing. And that's one way of looking at things. I've done role playing before. Um, just for an example, in, in uh, parenting groups, <laughs> when uh, the parent and the child are having difficulty understanding each other, I often switch roles. I'll have the child act as the parent and the parent act as the child, and then they get an idea of how they see each other by doing that. Role-playing is an effective way to simulate real-life experiences without the danger of actually going through with a, something that might be mentally or physically harmful. But another way to do this is through metaphor. And that is how the mindfulness-based ecotherapy program works on some levels, that we see nature as a metaphor for our own struggles, our own psychic struggles, our own psychodynamic struggles that we may be going through. If we use nature as a metaphor, it's a way of kind of externalizing the problem so that we see it as something separate from ourselves and as something that we can handle, something that we can change, something that we can modify. And there are different types of groups which serve different purposes and require subsequent planning based on what the purpose of the group is. And again, those categories can overlap. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. And when planning a group, some factors to be considered are the type of group being offered. In other words, what is its purpose? What is its intent? What is its common theme? What is its treatment paradigm? Those sorts of things. The target audience of the group. In other words, who am I shooting for here? What is my target demographic? And again, remember that you want to make it specific enough so that you attract people with a common goal or a common problem, but you don't want to make it so specific that you narrow your audience down to almost nothing. So if your treatment goal is to use mindfulness-based ecotherapy to treat LGBTQ people who have had addiction and trauma issues, you're narrowing your group down considerably. 
So just be aware of that. What is the target audience? What is the demographic? And it might help to go to your local chamber of commerce or your local county office that keeps track of demographics for the area where you live and see what the average population is there for your um, for your area and to see what needs there might be. So, for example, if you live in a rural environment, the needs are going to be different than if you live in an urban environment. If you live in a rural environment, you're going to have people who have already had experience in nature, and so this mindfulness-based ecotherapy stuff will be very simple to them because they live in nature. If you are working with people who live in a very urban environment, then ecotherapy is going to be new to them uh, because they might not be used to experiencing nature on a daily basis. So again, the demographics are important when planning a group. And you're also going to consider the level of skill of participants in the group. So if you're working with a bunch of college-educated people, you're going to be able to talk about things that you wouldn't be able to talk about with people who are high school dropouts. Not saying that all high school dropouts are uneducated or unintelligent, but just saying on average you're going to be able to talk about different topics with a college graduate than you are with a high school dropout. And also the level of skill in a particular area. So, for example, if a person is homeless, they may have difficulty with activities of daily living or certain life skills. Whereas a per- person who uh, is uh, employed, educated, living in a uh, suburb, they're going to have life skills that the homeless person might not have. Again, don't make assumptions. Don't assume that all homeless people have no life skills or that all high school dropouts are unintelligent. That can get you into trouble too. The idea here is just to gauge the level of skill that the members of your group have, regardless of their demographic characteristics. And you have to teach the group to the level of the person who has the least amount of skills. In other words, if I'm doing an ecotherapy group and I'm going on a hike as part of my ecotherapy group, I have to take into consideration the slowest moving member of the group. So uh, while one person who hikes 15 miles three times a week is going to be able to get up on a hiking trail and just take off, someone who mostly sits around on the couch eating potato chips and watching TV is not going to be able to hike 15 miles. So you have to tailor the level of skill in the group to the person with the least amount of skills in that particular area. Another example, if um, I am running an addiction group and I have people in my group, say there's one person who's been in recovery for 15 years, And then there's another person who was just discharged last night after an overdose. Those people are going to have different skill sets and different skill levels in maintaining sobriety or maintaining recovery. So that's another example of how to consider the level of skill of the participants in your group. Also, the training of the facilitators and training matters. If um, you're running a support group, training doesn't matter as much as if you're running an intervention group. But you do have to take into consideration the training that your facilitators might have and the level of skill that your facilitators might have. And then finally, the motivational stage of change of members of the group. We're going to go over the stages of change later on, but this is another thing that you have to consider. You have to teach the group to the level of the lowest motivational stage of the members. So if there are, say, half the group is highly motivated and half the group is, I'm just here because my mom said I had to be here or I'm just here because my probation officer said I had to be here, then they're not going to be really motivated for change. Their motivation is to get this class over with so they can get back to their lives. So you have to teach the group to that level of motivation, get them to buy into the change that you're trying to make, and then the rest of the group can support them in that.
Now, to integrate what we've talked about so far, we're going to look at a theoretical mindfulness-based ecotherapy group and how it might relate to the various different types of groups. First off, could a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group be a support group? It could be, depending on what you're choosing to run it as. So, for example, if you chose to run a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group for the treatment of addiction, then it could be a support group because all the members are using ecotherapy to support each other in addiction recovery. Could it be an intervention group? Yes, again, depending on what you're running it for. Now, if it's an intervention group, the person running the group will have to be a trained mental health professional, either a licensed professional counselor, a licensed marriage and family therapist, a licensed independent social worker, some person who has a license or some training in therapy to be able to do therapy interventions. But an example of an intervention group being used for mindfulness-based ecotherapy would be something like trauma. If um, I'm running a group for domestic violence survivors, for example, and we're doing that with ecotherapy, then we're doing specific coping skills, specific interventions, and we're tying the skills of mindfulness-based ecotherapy into what those people have dealt with in their lives. So in that case, a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group could be an intervention group. Could it be a prevention group? Certainly. What are we trying to prevent here? So, for example, if I'm running a group to try to prevent teen dating violence, I can use mindfulness-based ecotherapy for that. One way to do that is to develop skills of connection and demonstrate connection to nature, what we do to nature, nature does to us. And if we're being uh, engaging in violent activities and in teen dating, then karma comes around. <laughs> so that's the idea there. You could use that as a type of prevention group. Now, could mindfulness-based ecotherapy be a motivational group? Again, the answer is, depending on how you run it, it could be. What are you trying to motivate people to do? Of course, the basic answer there is that if you're trying to motivate people to live more sustainably, to develop and foster a relationship with nature, then it's excellent for that. Uh, it might also be motivational to help a person to stop drinking. We talk in uh, one of the educational classes for this group about Milton Erickson, who was a family therapist and he had someone recover from addiction by telling them to contemplate the survival qualities of the cactus. <laughs> so by using the cactus as a metaphor for what this person with addiction issues was going through, he was able to use it to draw that energy into himself and to motivate himself to, to remain in recovery. What about social change groups? Of course, mindfulness-based ecotherapy could be considered a social change group because we're advocating for social change in order to have a society return to a more sustainable and a more equitable lifestyle. In other words, to give back to nature at least as much as we take from nature. So in that way, it could be a social change group. And it's encouraging people in society to spend more time in nature and to use nature as a metaphor for the struggles that they're going through, to use nature as a teacher to help them to learn how to cope with their own lifestyle, how to live on this planet and be at one with nature, and to use nature as nurture by establishing that reciprocal cycle of nurturing. In other words, the more I give back to nature, the more nature goes back to me. What I do to nature, I do to myself. And then finally, using nature as a healer. Just being out in the woods, just being out in the sunlight can give you healing powers to be able to heal yourself. So again, that is a advocacy for social change. And by making room for nature, we make room for ourselves. Task-oriented group. Can mindfulness-based ecotherapy be a task-oriented group? 
I would say that in this case, since the mindfulness-based ecotherapy group has a set time, it's not open enrollment. It's 12 weeks, uh, once a week for 12 weeks, and then it's over. It's more difficult to fit it into a task-oriented category. However, there could be some opportunities there. In other words, if you decide that you want to have your group go pick up trash on a hiking trail somewhere, then you could come together for that task. Or if your group wanted to plant trees in a location or, or groom the location, pick up the uh, deadfall, take care of the plants, water the plants, then that could be a task-oriented group. I would say also that each one of the groups, each one of the 12 sessions does come together for a specific task during that session. And if you've studied the group or if you've read the workbook, you understand that each session is motivated by coming together for a task and the group members support each other doing that task. So in that way, it can be considered a task-oriented group. And then finally, is mindfulness-based ecotherapy a common interest group? Of course, you all have to be interested in nature <laughs> to be wanting to spend time in nature. So there is one common interest there, which is a love of nature or a wanting to foster that relationship with nature and use it to heal ourselves. But you could also look at other common interests in that group as well. Um, so, for example, if you did a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group specifically for cancer survivors, then they would have the common interest in being a survivor of cancer. Or if you did a mindfulness-based ecotherapy group specifically for people who are interested in a nature-centered spirituality, then the common interest there would be bringing more nature into their own spiritual path. So there are lots of opportunities there to look at the common interest factor as well. This is the end of video hour one. Coming up next in video hour two, we're going to be talking about planning for groups, part A. We're going to get into the discussion for planning for groups. And planning for groups is one of the hardest and one of the largest tasks in organizing a group. So there are three parts to planning a group. And the reason for this is we want to go into quite a bit of detail about how to plan a group because this is where most groups fail, the planning stage. There's an old saying that if you fail to plan, plan to fail. And we don't want you to fail in creating your group. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time on planning. That's the end of video hour one. This is the first video in the Running a Successful Group Continuing Education course sponsored by the Mindful Ecotherapy Center at mindfulecotherapy.org. And I would like to remind you that if you're watching this video on YouTube or some other internet source and you're interested in taking this course for continuing education credit, you may do so by visiting mindfulecotherapy.org and signing up for this online continuing education course. The information will be there on the website on the courses link. Thanks for listening and we'll see you in video two.